you know, we're getting together and talking again, and I always really enjoy our time. Um, but I, I, I really enjoy it when there's a lot to dive into, and you've given us a lot on this album. One of two albums. We're going to focus on part one first. Self-titled. Um, I'm always fascinated when self-titled isn't the first statement. When it's something that comes along two, three, four, sometimes even six, seven albums later, someone decides, you know, okay, I'm ready to put my name on this and to write on this. Um, what, what prompted you? I mean, it's probably the most obvious question, but I'm still fascinated by it. Why did you decide to name the album after the name you were given? Okay. I love this question. So two things. One, I was at dinner with two of my girlfriends and they were like, hey, what are you naming this album? And at this point, we had already been working on it for almost two years. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I was like, I, I would have thought a title would have come by now, but it just is still, I guess as I keep going, it'll present itself. But it's not coming up yet. And they were like, well, we know why. And I said, like, why? They were like, because this, this needs to be a self-titled record. And I was like, what? Wow. They are like, yeah, girl, you, you have poured all of yourself out onto this. And you've changed, like... We've watched this transformation take place in you during the course of making this record that the realest parts of yourself have made themselves known. Did you ask for a bit more detail? I mean, that would really spike my curiosity in terms of, okay, my self-awareness radar mm -hmm. is not as tuned in as what you're observing. So did they give you more, more sort of indication as to how they'd seen you change, like where the changes that occurred? Only because they were with me along the whole journey, I knew the parts that they were talking about. But for instance, so this is the first record I worked with Mike Elizondo on. Who just absolutely, I mean, tasteful is the word. Yeah. Every sound yeah. is communicating perfectly with the next one. Oh, come on. That's how I felt in the room. We all went down at the same time. And I'd be like, there was not one thing out of place. There was not one sound that was like, yeah, that's left to center, but we'll we'll sort it. Yeah. He was so true to the process. And so meeting him and working with him, it caused this voice to have to come out of me, this reality to come out of me, where I was so new when I came into music. I was cutting, so timeline perspective, didn't start singing until I was like 16 or 17. I would sing around the house and stuff, but I'd never really started singing. The first time I was in a band, like playing in public, was um, when I was like 18 or 19 in college. Did you feel like a late starter then? Did you feel like... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Because all my friends had bands when we were in high school, gigging around and stuff. And here I am in college and like just dipping my toe in, and it was a cover band. Mm -hmm. So we weren't even doing like mm -hmm. our own music, so right? So why did you do it? The cover band? Yeah, why did you, I mean, at that point, a lot of kids would figure, listen, that train has left the station. Maybe I should be focusing on something oh, else or. Yeah, no, it was locked. It was locked and loaded in there. I, It was kind of that thing of I can go break down doors or I can trust the process. I know that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be. And I know that I'm yielding to my craft right mm -hmm. now. I'm like. Oh, that's a statement. Yielding to my craft. Yeah. That's beautiful. I would sit and just sing all day. I mean, literally. We talked about the Clive Davis event. That son of a preacher man, I would sit in my shower over and over and over and over and just be like, when reverb sounds like this, I didn't even know the term was called reverb. I was thinking, when you play this live, if ever, make sure you can get spin, like put spins on it here and do this. I was doing that in my shower, having zero experience, like never stepped foot on stage. And because I was late, quote unquote, like, I got signed at 21, and I had my very first co-write in that signing. I was one of the, like, old school, we're going to develop her situations versus I have all this, all these fans, and I've put out five records, and now the label's finally finding me. Yeah. that's That was not my story. It was, I was from no man's land, literally just doing covers. And I jump on stage for this indie artist retreat thing that I thought was just a songwriting course. I didn't know that this was like to get signed by a label. Yeah. Jump up on stage. The band that I was with got, the lead singer got an emergency appendectomy. I sang one song and then they signed like very short. They sat me down and they were like, we want to sign you. Can you come to Nashville? I said, sounds great. Go to Nashville. I write a couple songs and that that's that. My point is your 10,000 hours was in front of people. 
I didn't have the like cultivating in my garage, like with a band, like the sound that I want to put out How into to the world. How to find an identity in that environment that you can actually stand behind. Not that mm -hmm. people aren't trying to help you for the right for the right reasons. But to your point, when artists come out now and they put a bunch of music out, they find their audience and then eventually a label knocks on their door and they're willing to open it, they've kind of got a better idea about who they are at that moment in time. Whereas you had to sort of figure that out with all of this expectation around yeah. you. In real time. In real time. Like I would remember standing on stage, I it was an arena show. I was probably like 10,000 people and I am learning how to sing the song in front of the 10,000. Like, my voice didn't even know what space it could hold yet. And there, it was so interesting. I just remember sitting here thinking, once you've reached this point, you've kind of had a little bit of experience. And this is, I'm literally learning as I'm in front of this many people. And that kind of came with its own challenges and joys at the same time. It makes you put more pressure on for certain reasons. And then for other reasons, you're like, well, I'm here and I'm just going to enjoy the joy. Of, I'm going to enjoy the joy of this. But Fast forward to that being the backstory, fast forward to now, why is it self-titled? It's because it took those records to find my voice, to find the voice that I can stand on in front of people and say, this is what I love. I love this sound. I love the way that we recorded this record. Like every person in the same room going at the same time. And I would listen, you know, it's that moment of I listen to Trevor Lawrence and Nate Smith, they played the drums. So I'm listening to cues from them. And then you have Max on guitar. And I'm changing vocal textures and things based on what they're expressing as well. And that kind of, it's like old school, but I, I mean, it's the place I come so Timeless alive. Timeless is what it is. I mean, it's kind of to your point where you started getting back in that room with musicians and okay, they're not covers this time, but just to, you're searching for human connection. That's really, I think, the through line in, to you. And you could say that about all artists. Sometimes artists make music at periods in their life where it's far more of an internal conversation. Whereas I feel like even when you're in that space, you are searching, you're yearning to connect. Oh, yeah. All day. It, I talked to a friend about this the other day, and he kind of spelled it out for me. Tell me, tell me what you think about this. I was saying, you know, there's... Certain creatives, I was having like, not a meltdown, I was just having a, I don't understand if I'm thinking the right way about this. You were having this. a meltdown, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I was having the, wait, please tell me I'm still on the right track. Yeah. There are creatives, and I thought there's creatives that when they walk into a coffee shop, they see people, they assess, they, they gain, they wait, they long for the story, they put, and then they go into their their space and they draw from this well of which they have been collecting with people and story and interaction and nothing is at random everything is intentional there's a reason why this is silver and it's metal there's a like every moment of nuance that you can pick up in the day has intentionality for what you can bring into a creative space and then there's creatives that are like i'm here the, and neither of these are bad or good. It's not in that. It's just the difference. There are creatives that are like, okay, I can see beautiful things and I can make them a reality. And I can just get the, there's a process to getting the job done. That doesn't take all this extra stuff. I'm just going to see this and we're going to make things happen, right? And I'm, I just happen to be a creative individual. And my friend point, said this. He said, well, actually, you're describing two different things. And I was like, well, can you help me draw some conclusions here? He's like, you're, you're talking about a creative versus an artist. He's like, there, are, there is a difference. And you actually, in order to be an artist, there is this absorption that happens just in life. You start to absorb, oh, I felt this from this person. There's this emotion. Oh, I connected to this with this person. Or that man that was on the side of the road that said I said hello to wait, I need to go sit and talk to him for 20 minutes and like just hold his hand. Like he said, that is actually part of the human connection that you're you're speaking of. That is the thing that fuels your artistry. And I think the closer I get in touch with that side of myself versus quieting it for, oh, we've got to do this thing, this thing, this thing, letting busyness take over, whatever, the closer I am to that human connection, the more authentic I can try 
even but a sliver to represent the human experience. To try and be an artist in, in, in this kind of modern world, this experience that we inhabit, which is um, we're also accessible now. Oh, yeah. People can reach you at any given time. They can yeah. ask you a million things. There's so many questions they can put to you. And you're successful and you have a, an amazing opportunity ahead of you with this album and beyond. So people are going to want to ask your opinion about things all the time. Mm -hmm. So there is something to be said about protecting your artistic space. Yeah. And I wonder about how challenging that is to, to be able to write an album. You know, these songs, what is it? Ten amazing, flawless songs on this part one. You had to have created space to do that. This doesn't sound like a distracted record to me. Oh, that makes me so happy. It, it was. I left Nashville for a little bit. I went. I got kind of in a different, just a different environment. I think changing my environment was so helpful. I used to hear people say that all the time. Oh, I got a cabin in the woods. And I'd be like, okay, come on. Do you have to be so bougie about it? Mm. I get it. Yes. I so get it. It's like, <laughs> I'm surprised wow. more people don't do it. I'm always like, why don't you go and make this album on a, on a, in a cabin on stilts over the water in the yes. Maldives? Yes. <laughs> yes. I have a friend. You could go anywhere. They go to Bali. And go I'm anywhere. like, go to Bali. Let's do it. I always loved how Michael Stipe from R.E.M. used to go to airports with a, a, a travel bag on his back and a pocket of demos from his bandmates. And he would just look at the departures board and pick a plane and a destination and they had tickets and just buy them then and there and just start and just check a five or six different cities around the world and just sit outside and write lyrics. Oh my god. Why gosh. wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you? My friend, his name is Jonas Myron. He does that. Mm -hmm. I will look, I'll call him whatever. And he's like, oh, I'm in Mexico City today. Oh, I'm in Versailles today. Oh, I'm, and I'm like, Jonas, how in the world? He's like, well, I would rather write 10 songs a year knowing all 10 of those songs are going to be used mm -hmm. than write 600 and only 10 of them get used. Well, you also have to live a life to write about life. Mm -hmm. You have to find a, an environment whereby you can understand what you're saying internally, but also apply it to, to what's going on outside mm -hmm. the window, yeah. right? So it, that disconnect is obvious. Yeah. When you listen to certain yeah. things, you're like, oh, they, they've moved on from kind of how the rest of the world is living. So I Lauren, what, what is the soulful beginning of this album for you? What is the natural start for you? We know that song number one, uh, at least according to my track listing, is Thank God I Do. But what is the sort of, where is the central heartbeat of this album for you? Oh my gosh, that's hard. Um, I would say for the first 10, whoa, that is so tough. For the first 10, <laughs> This is, okay, this has been the problem with figuring out I know what sequence, I think. figuring out all, okay, what do you think? I think, I think? I think it starts where it ends. I think these are the days to me is a really central part of this album. Yeah, I can see that because it takes on all of all the of sonic elements that are kind of expressed through the rest of the record individually. Yeah, and Ooh, it's yeah. a very generous subject. It's yeah. the idea of of putting something out into the world that reaches the most amount of people, right? These are the days. Like, we're all experiencing them, all of us together. I love that song. That song was written, we ended up doing, I was in the studio, I was tracking with my, or right, we were in the writing process. My manager calls and she's like, hey, where are you? It was like 11 o'clock at night, I was at home. I said, well, I'm, I'm at home. She said, you're going to be excited about what I'm going to tell you. And I said, okay, what's up? She's like, they're doing this concert or this festival called Wonderfront in San Diego. It's the first one since the pandemic. And they want you to open for uh, Kings of Leon, like direct support to Kings of Leon. And I, my high school was Kings of Leon, like love Kings of Leon. And I said, well, I'm going to have to have new music in order for that to happen. Like I got to get on with it. And I'm going to write a song specifically for that show because it was the first call that we had gotten out of the pandemic. It was the first one that said, what it said to me is you are free. We can do this again. Yeah. You're going to be on stage. We're going to be able to sing. Like you're going to have the audience, like the world is waking back up. And, and there it, was so much anxiety attached to that, to, to that fear of, of, of performance going away. I, I mean, almost every artist I spoke to on and off the record touched on it at some point that the biggest fear they had was that the world would just not be able to create a safe space for you to perform mm -hmm. again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was the two years of 
that was, thank God I do. Like the panic associated with, did I let this thing become bigger inside of me than like that I can't handle these times. Like I can't handle this difficulty, this thing being, being on stage, being in front of people. I got so accustomed to that level of interaction where it's like you have 15,000 people in front of you. I don't care what anybody says. No Zoom concert with 20,000 people in there is going to. We gave it a go. We gave it a go. Keith Urban will forever have a place in all of our hearts for standing up on stage <laughs> in front of a thousand cars and giving it a go. I did it. I did two shows like that where they came in their cars. They they put uh, they beep, lawn they chairs. Yeah, yeah. And they beep, beep. I know. Oh my gosh, sitting on stage and being like, okay, I this was actually such a good lesson because I didn't realize how much I allowed the applause to direct the flow of the night. Like I didn't think of how much, I knew it internally, but I didn't know it cognitively of how much I allowed the audience to really shape where the ebb and flow, how many breaths am I gonna take in between these songs? Mm. How many, those kind of things. So whenever you finish the song and you're waiting for what you're used to as far as pacing is concerned, and there's no meter. It's all kinds of You're awkward. Like, it's all kinds of awkward. I feel like I'm I mean, if you actually break it down, it's almost every performer's worst nightmare. Yeah, totally. <laughs> that it you're totally. going to finish giving your heart and soul yeah. to the people and there's going to be no noise at all at the end of that experience. Yeah, you do actually hear the crickets when you're <laughs> in a field of a yeah. thousand cars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was, you know, we had to do what we had to do and that's that. But I do love the fact that I walked, Mike was like, I got something for you. Mm. See, see what you feel about mm. this. He said, just jump in the studio and sing whatever, like jump into the booth, sing whatever you want. And I kept singing this line over and over. These are the days, these are the days. And he was like, yeah, yeah, keep doing that. You know, keep, keep going with that. And I just kept saying that line over and over and over. We've been dreaming of. And I said, hey, these are just placeholder lyrics. Like, I don't know if this actually means anything, but I do like, like the energy of this because I want to write this song for this show in response to, oh my gosh, these are the days we've been waiting for. Right, right. And he said, no, you need to keep all this. So, fast forward, we go to New Orleans on a riding trip. I bring my the crew down there and we finish that song in New Orleans. So, it actually kind of piggybacked off of this space that I love so dearly. I love New Orleans. I love my roots, where I came from. And this sound that's coming out of it with the expression of the horns and the energy is also what I feel when I'm in New Orleans. Yeah, it definitely has that feeling of being on the street and hearing music coming from every angle. And at times in the calendar, the, the music comes to you as a community. I love that. I love that a lot of New Orleans and a lot of the culture in, in, in a city like New Orleans, not the only one, but is is people celebrate with music, they grieve with music, yeah. they connect with music, mm -hmm. um, the they drink the to music line. and party to yes. music. I mean, it's yeah. it's not, in a city like that, music is not in the background. It is 100% a foreground experience. And I hear it. And, and These Are The Days has brothers and sisters on this record as well. You know, uh, a song like New, which to me is really, I think for you as Lauren Daigle, the artist, the most overt step into what I would consider to be modern sort of R&B and pop. Mm -hmm. This idea of like a little bit of kind of early mid nineties, Lauren Hill, yes. you know, mixed in with, with, with the sound of New Orleans as well. And I wanted to, to touch on that song specifically because funnily enough, when I pressed play on the album, cause it's not an order, that was the first song I heard. Oh, and I was come just like, on. whoa. <laughs> Hello, Departure. Yeah, but yeah. in a great way. So I yeah. want to talk a little bit about the making of that as well, because you sound like you had fun on that, lyrically oh. and performance-wise. I wish that I could just show you this little clip of us in the room when we were writing it. Natalie recorded this thing, and she's like singing like this, and it's me with uh, an SMA, and I'm literally sitting there like, oh, time is time, whatever, and... I'm like in this song, whatever, and here she like <laughs> make, but the moment that it captured for me was going back to that thing. I haven't heard my voice like this. Mm. I haven't heard, I knew all these sounds were in me because this is how I sing around the house, but mm. I haven't really heard it outside of me before. Mm -hmm. And so 
she comes in. She's like, I got this idea. I think we should write a, a song called New. And I said, oh, girl, I'm about that all the way, just even with the title. And she was like, yeah, I met this friend years ago, and this person went through a drug addiction that every single day their dad would write them and say, hey, you, you can come home. You're free to come home. Like, there's no shame. Come home. We love you. We love you. Every day, letter, 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 letter. And she, Natalie, met this friend years and years later after this experience. But she said, I never, there's not even a remnant of this old person, person that she had to say goodbye to in order to find something good for herself, right? And so she said, I, I look at my friend and think, what a wonder. People are never too far gone. Like they're never too, people can change. Well, we have to start looking at life as this linear experience. We, yes. we have to start, in my, my experience now, I'm looking through at my life and the lives of my closest and I'm thinking there's thousands of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that me is still back there. Yeah. yeah. Neil Young said this. I love this. This is, he, he's got it the closest to getting it right for me. I said, oh, you know, when you made that album, he was like, yeah, that guy's still around. He's just, Living back there, loving those songs. Yeah. Still making that album probably in his head. Yeah. But he's still there. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of people in between him and yes. me today. Yeah. And there's more of me to come. Yep. And I loved that because mm -hmm. we, we get so attached yeah. to who we've been that yeah. we forget who to become. Oh, yeah. And the thing about from the outside perspective, and I have to do this with myself, it's hard to watch people evolve whenever we love and long for the people who they are. But to sit alongside someone and watch someone evolve and say, oh, yeah, I am I'm studying this course. That's how this record feels mm -hmm. like there's been an evolution that has taken place. And it's like, OK, I hope that, you know, the girl that was once there mm -hmm. still very much lives inside of me, yeah. you know. But here's all of these other elements that I've lived I put out a record five years ago. So from the past five years, here's all these other elements that have been introduced into my life that I can now deliver and share upon, you know. Yeah. But that new is one of those that Mike, Natalie came in with the idea. Mike was like, hey, I got this bass thing going. Y'all want to hear this? Mike, his bass playing. Holy cow. Yeah. He was like, check this out. So he's rocking on the bass with this track. Uh, Natalie's coming in with the idea and kind of tells this story and it was just like wildfire. It was one of those rights that you're like, okay, okay, this is becoming so fun. And I remember in the process of making the, the record, Mike said, hey, I, wanna, I want you to do something that you haven't done before. And I said, okay. He said, I want you to talk over the record, over the track. Now, this is like old school hip hop, duh, right? But for me, I'm like, Oh, Mike, I know how cool that sounds. I don't think I'm that cool. Like, come on, bro. This is, that's cool. And he's like, no, no, just trust me. Just do it. And I, I, it was like behind the glass, right? I've got all these people in the room and I just did one of these numbers, like full shield, fully embody something, someone else. And that was one of my favorite moments on the entire record of like, wow, I got to <laughs> I got to discover like fun places and you can hear these like little ping pong runs that I'm doing here and there and like talking behind myself that I've I love when Lauren Hill does that. Like the the little clips that she will get in those moments, you're just like, that could be a hook of its own. It's yeah. so good. No, that's Smithsonian that album. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the last five years in particular, well, ever since it came out, but I feel like generationally artists continue to come through and mm -hmm. reference that record and mm -hmm. reference that record. And it's something to your point to do with the subject matter being very deeply human and at times very tough yeah. to listen to, but playfully mm -hmm. delivered for you to move to. Yeah. And that is just this great combination of elements. And this album is full of them, Lauren. I mean, I think about a song like, you know, Ego. Oh, yeah. Now that's a tough song to listen to from a human point of view because we all have one. Mm -hmm. It's one of the one of the hardest things in the world is to live a life that's not in service to your ego. Yeah. Oh yeah. And yet, the the arrangement and the music around it 
it's quite ego driven. Yeah. <laughs> so it has this it's kind of confidence of like, so it's an interesting clash. Mm -hmm. It do, was do you know meant I mean? to do that. It was meant to do that. Yeah. yeah that was it. fully intentional. So here I, I church girl walking out of church and I just hear this, I'm the wrestling with my ego. And I'm like, oh, okay. It's a Vegas run. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. Such a show tune yeah. type thing. So I hear, I'm like, ego. Okay, okay, ego. And I had this whole back half, whatever, go into the studio with Mike and uh, Jason Ingram. And I was like, hey, guys, I have an idea. I want to write a song called Ego. Jason looks at me like, Lauren, are you kidding? Like, come on, girl, that's going to be tough. Because what you can't do with a lyric about ego is sound egotistical. You can't be an artist <laughs> who's driven by ego. And trying to understand how to actually control it to the point yeah. where you get to that place of wisdom. Yeah. And then acknowledge that. Yeah. Especially on album number three. When you're the whole or the whole system is built around yeah. the ego of the yeah. artist, right? Yeah. 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 People so, it's an easy way for people to call foul, yeah. right? It's a it's a house of cards. He's mm -hmm. right to be concerned. Yeah, he that he was. He was like, Are you kidding me? Mm. But this is where I was like, yes, because and this is no, I, like, hear me say no hate, no hate at all. Like, I don't, but I want to give other, I want to give people another option to, I got to have cars, I got to have women, I've got to have this. I got, like, I just want there to be another option to see, like, you're still, there is still something beautiful inside of you if that isn't your driving, if the ego isn't your driving force. Mm -hmm. If it isn't the thing that you m make yourself bow down to every day, because I do, I do see where in culture ego is so celebrated, and I I get it. Like, but I, the people that have made such an impact on my life are the people who walk in the room with all the pedigree in the world, and they sit at your table like they're just. Some rando on the street. But it's funny. You have to go through that process to come through the other side of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only person I think I've ever been in the presence of, and there was 10,000 of us, who I think has probably lived the longest life in service to something beyond the ego, was the Dalai Lama. That's the bar. Yeah. Now, I mean, that's yeah. why everyone else I've met, even the people I hold in the highest regard, I use someone like Rick Rubin as a benchmark on how to just serve the music in the most beautiful way. And yet this was Rick from... New York, this is punk rock Rick. Yeah. This was Rick who was like into wrestling and Beastie Boys and gold chains and like, da, 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 da. like it's yeah. not like ego didn't serve its purpose at one mm -hmm. point or another. Yeah. How does ego work for you? If you've written a song of this, you can't leave it behind altogether. Yeah. How, what is your relationship like with your ego now? So the sonic landscape that you're talking about is the wrestle of that. I wanted it to sound like a war. I wanted it to sound like a frenzy. I'm done with this. I'm done with this. That's the outward expression, but the internal expression is ego, 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 yeah, ego, yeah, ego. Yeah. And the wrestle of, oh my gosh, I have to sit with this. This thing is never going to leave me. It's ne it, As I am laying in the casket, there will still be some part of my ego left behind, okay? So how do I, like you said, let it serve you? How does it actually- Not control you, right? How, yeah, not you. control you. And- I think finding, or for me, I'll just say what I've learned is I would rather find an ego if I have to have one in the positive. Like, what is it that I can do with people or how can I help people so that it's more of a collaborative thing versus, and, and I say that in regard to when I walk in during the day, I'd rather be known as, because if we're taking the ego, as the someone who brought a smile to someone's face. Mm. Let ego serve me there. Like her reputation wrapped in the ego is kindness. Don't believe them. Mm. That song in particular to me says a lot about the album, which is that you are immersed in your faith. You do have faith in something beyond yourself. You do search for answers elsewhere, but it's not enough unless you actually believe it. Mm -hmm. A thousand percent. That time, the time in which we wrote this one was right out of the chaos of 2020 where people were angry with each other and didn't have this resolve, this 
I, I would see little glimpses of it. Like if I turned on Instagram, I would make sure, okay, I'm going to look at, you know, something that's life giving as far as humanity can be kind to each other. Yeah. And I walked in to the studio and Natalie was like, Hey girl, Hey girl, how she does. She was like, I got this idea. And I said, okay, yeah, come on, hit me with it. And when she sat at the piano and all she had I think at that point how you gonna she was doing these numbers you know and she would resolve with if you don't believe them and I was like no 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 this is scary like you're making this is like a song that rides in conviction it lives in that space and when I looked at the state of the world, I was like, oh, come on, humanity, like, we can do this. We can get back together. We can draw near to each other. And, uh, yeah, when I every when I heard it back in the studio the first time, I didn't know it was going to bear the weight that it did. J- just for me, just internally, I didn't, I didn't know, oh, whoa, that was where we were going on this thing. Okay, well, here it is. Yeah. And I either get afraid of it and say, we don't do this, or I say, yeah, let's, let's go. So where does the fear come from? When you, when you, in that brief moment when you're like, we don't do this, mm-hmm. what is getting in between you and letting go? I think it is that when you say, or I, I'll say this for myself, when I sing something, I have to sing it with like the utmost conviction, the utmost r- truth, authenticity. And those are words that I'm like, oh, this is kind of hard to live by. This is easy in context of the song is great, it sounds good, whatever. But like, what do I say in a day sometimes that, oops, I probably didn't really believe that. So you actually, because you've committed it to music, you, you feel like you've set an unrealistic expectation for yourself and even for others. Yeah, I'm like, but oh, I didn't I get it from that song. Okay, good, good. I I, I got it almost as an acknowledgement that human beings are flawed. Mm, okay, keep going. I like this. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> this is that's good. It, to me. It was like. It was a warning that when you're at your most pious, you better be sure that the rock you stand on is, is the foundation is strong. Yeah. Yeah. But that it's okay. Mm-hmm. That it, 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 it's okay to live a, a life that is um, zigzaggy. Mm-hmm. I find like in the gray is where we actually do find truth. Like it's in that, like, whoa, okay, this is more perplexing. Than, this is not where I thought I was going to find that answer. Well, you know we don't own anything, right? No. We don't own anything. Nothing. I like that. I like that there's that there's this transient expression in this course of life that we all get to kind of ride on. And the freer you are is the op- more open the hands are, right? Yeah. When we when we do sit and say I I choose not to own. I choose to just be and live. And that's where I taste like the sweetness of freedom what song on the album do you think represents the next step now that you've come to terms with who you were versus who you are what is the song that speaks to you on this part one of this of this journey musically that you think is the closest to understanding that lesson oh man i would probably say valuable (laughs) that's so funny i was literally going to say that as well because it it feels like it's serving a different purpose. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah. That song, I was in the park I was in a parking lot. I just finished a therapy session. And she the way that my therapist had done this, she kept asking all of these questions to make me ask myself a question. And like, great psychology, good job on you. But what it did was make me say, Are you valuable? And she said, you have, you have actually tried so many courses to make yourself feel more valuable. Like you are constantly on this quest of, quest of learning your value mm. versus just actually knowing, having a knowing of I am valuable. I think that's the artist's journey. Yeah. To some and, degree. And then put yourself in the vortex of the music industry. Yeah. That yeah. sucker will chew you up and eat you yeah. whole, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I just, I think because what happens is if there's any element of an insecurity as far as value is concerned, 
the music industry will make it louder and louder and louder because there's so much competition. There's the so much. The whole psychology is built on it. Yes. Literally. From day one. Day one. Day one. And it's. You could take more of the money, but don't take the psychology. Yeah, exactly. We need the psychology in yeah. order to keep the artists connected. You know? Yeah. So seen it. we land in this place, and I'm in the parking lot, and I go in, I get the chorus, the first half of the chorus, and if you feel like you are not valuable, let me tell you there's more. So I get that part. If your heart is running in circles, telling your head things that are not true. That's where it stopped. I go into the room, and Lori McKenna, who is, D have you ever met Lori Dinar? Okay, incredible writer. She had the whole back half, and we sat there, and she was like, who are you speaking to? And at the time, I also had a person in my life that I needed to say this to, mm. and uh. I was like, let's go through like line by line and talk about like situations that we can find ourselves in. Looking in the mirror, like as a female, so a lot of people are like, am I good enough? Does my hair look right? Does this, all of that ideology and learning, what am I communicating through my visual, right? Am I good enough? Am I worthy enough? And there were, there were just so many little points that I was like, oh, I can see where that would have been from something in childhood. Was that something in childhood? It all comes from childhood. Yeah. And it, there was yeah. just this conversation that she and I started to have that landed itself onto the page. And it's one of my favorite songs on the record. It's one of the most healing songs on the record. Mm. And also, I think what you were saying before, uh, this beautiful melodic refrain this, and the pause before there's more. It's one of the most timeless phrasings. Ooh. It's amazing. I think it's probably the most timeless moment on the album. Wow. Because it's like you let it breathe. You let it sit. And then it's just this delicate delivery of like, you know, there's more, but it carries so much weight. Oh. Like it's really goosebump stuff. That's good for me to hear. Because mm. some of those things aren't intentional. They're just felt. And so That's when. That's why it resonates. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk to you about the idea of therapy really quickly because I do a lot of therapy and I love it and I'm I feel I always feel very grateful when I get a chance to do mm. therapy because it really is a it's a it's a it's a luxurious resource. Oh yeah. To tend to tend to yourself that way, but I've always thought about therapy in 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 the through the lens of um, people who find faith in spirituality mm, and I mm -hmm. and I wonder how you how those two meet yep. for the first time. Because the idea of talking to somebody about yourself and finding a greater sense of self-awareness, to some degree on paper at least, seems to be undermining the value of going to church and finding it within a community. Yeah, And I've, I've always wondered how those two things question. talk to each other. That is, I've never asked, I've never been asked that question. Mm. And that is so, that is such a good question. Because we see all of these things with mental health right now. And I think in the church, not let me rephrase. I think there are some times where that can be a shameful experience, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But Hard to understand on mass, eh? Mm -hmm. When it's such an individual experience. Experience. And and the, and the point of being together in a church is to speak as a collective mm -hmm. union. It's that is the. I last night went to this uh, service and I was just having a war. And I told my friend, I said, "Hey, I need. Can you encourage me? Like, I need somebody to." say the truth to me right now. And that to me is some of the greatest therapy built in faith right there. Those are, that's where it is like hand in hand married. Like, can you tell me these are the things I'm wrestling? This is how I'm projecting that wrestle. And these are the areas in life in which it's catching up to me. Can you tell me what's true via the lens of faith? Love that, super grateful. In the Bible, it talks about the Holy Spirit is the wonderful counselor. So you go to counseling, right? And then you see, there. wait, is this a dichotomy? Like you have the wonderful counselor, but why are you asking for help? Yeah. If this isn't necessarily quite as talked about in our faith or the doctrine is of what we believe, but it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. One of them is counseling. Mm. So there are people put on this planet to help with counsel, to say, hey, I don't, 
I'm one of those. I don't know what's going on right now. I can't. I can't di- differentiate my head from my heart. Can you help the line get a little clearer? Like the communication isn't right. And there's people that are gifted with saying, "Yeah, let me let me help. Let me say." what I've learned in school and all of this teaching, let me also bring in. And that to me feels like the full picture. I That's where I get the full picture, right? Where faith doesn't have to reject therapy. Like I think they actually can be hand in hand. I agree. And I, and I, I also, I, I'm, I'm not beholden to any one particular faith, but I find real joy in watching people experience it Mm -hmm. and i see a lot of beauty oh yeah in just the imagery and the detail and the history of each room you walk into and the calm and i've definitely walked into churches when i've needed to and not known why or not even known what the religion is yeah it's just a church yeah it could be I could think I'm walking into one particular religion and there's just a finite little detail Mm -hmm. that it's something else. I don't know. I'm searching for some peace. Mm -hmm. I love that quest. That quest. I I do that on my leisure. Like I'll go, Mm. I'll pop into different places and, and there's always something to learn. There's Mm. always something, something to gain, something that you can hold on to right in, in these different expressions of faith. And I, like, I walked into um, this space the other day that I'd never been to before. And I didn't know that I was going to love it as much as I did. And I sat in there and I looked at my friend and I said, I'm coming back here. Yeah. And they were like, okay. And I was like, yeah, much different than probably what you would have expected of me. But I, why would I not want to gain from this, this environment, you know, and from these people and from the way they believe. Like, this is new. John Batiste understands that, so I'm so happy to hear him on this record. And it's not like St. Fer- Ferdinand, which is, is a, a good way for us to pause until next time, to me is such a beautiful example of all of that because, you know, the streets are full of characters mm-hmm. and the grit and grime is evident, but there's something deeper there that you, keeps getting you drawn back. And oh, I, I yeah. just love the theme of that song. Yeah. the pl- Oh, the places you will go. Yeah. I got all this Dr. Seuss stuff. And I think about that. Oh, the places you'll go. The places that you won't wander are the Mm. place that held something for you that you never got to partake in. Mm. I would never want to look at an environment or a place and say, that's, that's, that's not me. That's not my thing. You know, I, I love the streets that are full of color and life and realness you know and I find myself coming alive the most in those spaces and for some people that's not they're like I need things to be in order and I need this to be this way and whatever I'm the opposite I'm like the more unruly the more I can like discover new things and it doesn't have to be kept in a bow you know so this song is one of the I just like one of the most precious songs to me because of how it came about Natalie and I started writing this song it was all about leaving a place behind that you once loved to bring yourself to something that where you belong now, that kind of idea. And it's the letting go of, for me, it was letting go of home in a way. Like, this is the home I love. And absorbing the new. Nashville is new. I'm, I've lived here 10 years, but I'm saying from the origin of who yeah, I was. Yeah, you're a wanderer by, by trade. Yeah, I'm a little gypsy girl. So I, in this song... Uh, she's like, let's just like write this cathartic experience. It doesn't need to be whatever. It can just be like something fun, a fun exercise that we do as a song. And I was like, okay, cool. Well, this will never make the record, so we'll just do it. <laughs> this is a theme developing here. Dory, these are placeholder lyrics. Dory, this placeholder. will never make the record. Yeah, yeah, never make You need failure to succeed. Is it that you ridiculous? Need, you need the prospect of failure to reach your full potential. Yeah. It's totally normal. Yeah. It's that it's the uh, I'm going to procrastinate because it's the closest edge to failure that I can. You need to to. know that it's going to be okay if you don't pull it off. Mm -hmm. That's how you pull Pull it off. off. (laughs) Exactly. Where's the parachute? Where's the freaking cord on that parachute? Yeah. Yeah. So the I love this because we wrote we wrote four versions. No, I'm kidding. We wrote three different versions, Mm. and at this the top, whenever I just wrote it with Natalie, it was just the two of us in there. 
and it was her acoustic guitar. We wrote it in two different settings. One was over Zoom, one was in person. And because I was kind of like, yeah, I'll say whatever I want because this isn't going to mean anything. Like, we don't have to worry about this ever landing on the record because she is, her melodies are such a good, like, folk driven mm. for some of the things that she does. It's like that storytelling essence that I absolutely treasure. And in the discovery of this new day and age that I was living in, being isolated at home, I found myself falling in love with storytelling. In songwriting specifically. You know, it does it brilliantly is Julia Michaels. My oh, days. I got to write with her My and days. we didn't write. We just ended up hanging out the entire time. Yeah, it was guess three what? hours. She's, of she's writing the whole time. I love it. That's That's in why. her head, she's writing yes. the whole time. Yes, she's yeah, brilliant. She's so we ended up uh, getting this kind of storytelling thing out. We did a Zydeco version of this song to mm -hmm. just like feel like home. Mm -hmm. And we did a full band version of this song to feel like home. And after we cut those two with Mike, I was like, hey, I'm st this isn't feeling right still. Like, I think we need to go back to the basics of how we wrote the song. Can we just grab an acoustic guitar and just try it out? And something came so alive. I've never, going back to this is something new, I've never released a song with me in an acoustic guitar. Everything has always been a Rhodes mm -hmm. or piano driven. Mm -hmm. So learning the quality of sound in the, the way an acoustic guitar could actually be used versus just like the strums. To yeah. me, the piano and the keyboard, not every time, but often is the sound of somebody in situ, in an environment, um, capturing a room, capturing a moment, something internal. The guitar to me is the sound of the wanderer. Yes. The traveler. Yeah. It's just yes. by the nature of it, it's momentum, it's movement. Mm -hmm. It's like you, how many times we've seen videos yeah. and on film, people walking with guitars. Yeah, it's the sound of taking the music outside of your environment. Yeah. that that frequency mm. frequency can be muffled mm. and wide. Mm. And it's footsteps. Yeah, it's footsteps. It's moments. Oh, I love that. I told I love that so much because we ended up getting John Batiste mm. on the melodica mm. and then Natalie Hemby on background vocals. <laughs> And so it's like the two worlds of New Orleans and Nashville got to live in a home together. So that's what you do, Lauren. You be pretty, you, you know what? You bring worlds together. Love it. Self titled album number one. I'm assuming we'll talk about album number two. I hope so. Same. I always enjoy seeing you. Yes. Thanks same. for taking the time. Thanks for having me in Nashville. I Thanks, Zane. These are the days.